So hi everybody and welcome. We'll just wait a couple minutes for everybody to join and then we will kick off. And just yeah in the chat just let us know where you're dialing in from. Now, Caroline, I'm just wondering if the chat is disabled for... I was people? looking for the same thing. <laughs> I'm just seeing the presenters. Just, just enabled. Sorry about that. That's okay. So, yeah, everybody just... um. There we go. Hi. Hey, Brisbane, Sydney. Happy days. Oh, lovely. Melbourne. All, oh, my gosh. Awesome. Queensland, Gold Coast, Florida, San Francisco, <laughs> Ohio, USA, not sunny at all, but very autumn. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, we do need to join the dots. That would be fun. Might have a bit of a gap around the UK because it's like 2 o'clock for them. 2 a.m. I should say. Atlanta, Detroit. Nice. Fantastic. All right, Sadal, do you think we should kick off? Yes. I was just saying it's starting to slow down just a tad so we can get started. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us uh, wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, this is our APAC version of the analytics tug. So some of you are joining on Thursday, some on Wednesday, which I always find really cool. Um, very quickly, if you're new to this tug, uh, it's slightly different in a couple of ways. One, it's totally virtual. So even in a post pandemic world where people will be back in person, this will remain virtual so that we can stay global. Um, the other thing is we're really focused on analytics, so you'll see topics today specific to creating better analyses um, all the time. So we will have people from Ask Data, Tableau Desktop, Web Edit, et cetera, um, to chat about all things analytics. You can always find us at the user group link here, just usergroups.tableau.com slash analytics, uh, and this QR code is available in all of our slides. We've got a great couple of sessions. Uh, we've got a duo of Autumn and Lindsay who are talking about building better dashboard designs. And then Ray will close us out with Benchmarks, a generic AB set comparison tool. Um, but quickly, just to introduce ourselves, this is the current slate of TUG leaders. Annabelle is based in Zurich, um, where it is roughly 2 a.m. Uh, so she won't be joining, but you have Sam and I here. Uh, quickly about myself, I am a desktop specialist, Tableau feature author, and also a part of the Community Equity Task Force. In addition to leading this talk, um, I really enjoy using uh, data to tell better stories uh, and, and really spend a lot of time on Twitter with the data fam. And then when I'm not visiting, um, usually watching sports or drinking wine, which has become my pandemic hobby. Uh, Sam, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm Sam Batchelor. I'm based in sunny, well today it's sunny, Brisbane, Australia. Um, this has, it's going to be my last time co-hosting the wonderful Analytics Chug. So I'm going to be passing over to somebody else. Um, we were hoping he was going to join today, but I will introduce him afterwards anyway. I've been working for Tableau, with Tableau for very many years now i think maybe seven years or something like that as a developer and a server admin and um 
definitely part of the data fam community love attending the conferences and making friends all over the world so yeah that's me so we would like to um, and hopefully he'll be here for the next um, APAC session the new APAC host will be Prasan um, I think he was traveling at the moment and so he was a bit worried about the uh, the ability to, to uh, find an internet connection where he was but he is a um, very celebrated um, Tableau social ambassador a featured author um, and does a lot of the um, uh, the Tableau buddy talks um, so he's just got a lot of experience he runs other tugs and music groups and stuff so he will be bring a lot of experience to co-hosting the analytics tug which will be great so I'm really looking forward to to watching him um, the next time he can come on. Yeah, I am as well. It'll be cool to to hang out here with Prasam. Um, very quickly, um, there's not a lot of rules. I would say the, the biggest rule, have fun, enjoy. Please use the chat to let people know what you're enjoying. However, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A box. It's a little easier to track um, the comments in the Q&A when you have questions for speakers. Uh, and then just in case anyone is wondering, the session is being recorded and goes up on the Tableau YouTube channel afterward. Uh, usually we try to get that in the next day or two. So sometime end of this week or early next week, you should have that up online. Also, feel free to use our handle here, analytics tug or hashtag analytics tug if you want to share things on social. With that, I will let Sam introduce our first couple of speakers. Yeah, so today, first up, we have two amazing speakers who will be presenting on prototyping, better build it, building better dashboard design. So we're going to have Autumn and Lindsay. So Autumn is a two times Tableau social ambassador and six times Viz of the Day winner um, and recipient of the Michael W. Cristiani Community Leadership Award um, and best content creator at the 2022 Vizies. Um, which were presented live at Las Vegas. Um, so well done on that autumn. Um, definitely an inspiration for so many people in the data fam community, not just because of your visits, but the way that you help other people, um, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to call out as well, Autumn is a nomad <laughs> wanderer of the world. You never know where she will be will be posting from. I love that. Um, so again, just love seeing where you are in the world. Um, and so yeah, follow her on Twitter and see where she is at any at any month of the year. You probably won't know. She'll be just flitting around, maybe uh, visiting some different tugs or something like that. Yeah. If you could go, yeah, it's great. Thank you. So, and we've got Lindsay, um, probably needs no introduction, but three times Tableau Visionary, four times Public Ambassador and a leader of Project Health Viz, um, founding member, I believe, of Mum to Viz, probably, <laughs> yeah, and eight times Viz over the day. So that's just fantastic achievements right there. Um, and yeah, just just a really uh, lovely member of the community who's always willing to help and is very positive and inspirational, I know, for a lot of people around the world. So thank you very much, um, both of you, Autumn and Lindsay, for joining us. And I'll I'll hand it over to you guys to to present building better dashboard designs. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Sam and Sadal. All right, I am going to share my screen. In a typical fashion, right, let's see here. Whoa, yeah. Did that work or did that screw up? Let's see here. Looks, Looks good. Be good. good. Yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. So um, we are super excited to be here. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think uh, bottom I'll probably say like. So it's late over here in the US, but we are going to be super energetic and really excited to do this, even though we're ready for bed. But thank you all for joining in. Uh, this will be great. So we're going to talk about prototyping, building better dashboard designs. Autumn and I had given this uh, talk at the conference. And so hopefully, or I guess if you didn't see it, this will be fantastic. Let's get going then, I guess. Um, so uh, I know sort of our in you know, introduced, uh, Sam introduced me, but I'm a senior consultant and design lead at Health Data Viz, a small consulting agency. 
Um, visionary ambassador, I've been using Tableau for over eight years. I also am a professor at Temple University and co-author of the book, Visualizing Health and Healthcare Data. My background is in healthcare. And uh, you can find me at Zendal Data. Um, love Tableau. Uh, and as you'll see from this presentation, uh, really enjoy the whole aspect of prototyping and making really good designs in order to help better my um, dashboard development. Oh, that didn't go, there we go. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah, that's right, sorry. Um, so my best, my favorite thing about like designing dashboards. So um, I use a tool called Figma. We'll talk a little bit about that today, but one of my favorite processes of that, of the whole process of um, developing something is that design phase. Um, I really like doing that in the morning and getting kind of really creative and thinking through that whole process. So um, hopefully you get a little bit of flavor on why that is so important to me. As much as I love the analytics and the Tableau part of so side of things, which is what we're here for, there's um, a clear aspect of why there's, why that the um, prototyping side of things is gonna help you more quickly do your development. Hello, everybody. My name is Autumn. Um, I too love Tableau, and I wouldn't be on a call this late if I didn't. But I'm very excited to talk about prototyping with you guys today. Uh, I'm actually a senior principal consultant at Page Data. I got promoted since the conference, uh, which is exciting. Uh, Page Data is a, a data consulting firm. Uh, we help organizations with everything from ingestion to visual analytics, which is what I help support. Uh, as Sam said, social ambassador. I also co-founded a community initiative called Diversity in Data uh, because it's one of the things that I am I'm really passionate about. And you can find me uh, on Twitter always, but in your state or country sometimes maybe, because I do uh, also like to travel. And then uh, similar to what Lindsay said, you know, I love uh, the creative part of the process. Working consulting, I get to work with a lot of different organizations who have a lot of different data and problems, and I love helping them understand more about their company. Uh, and that's why prototyping is great. Spoiler alert, we'll get more into it later, but uh, it's where you can really align on the vision for what they're looking for and what's going to best support them. And I help love uh, working with them through that process. So Autumn and I combined, I mean, this might not be accurate anymore, but it's around 150 public data visualizations um, together and countless more for clients, I'm sure, uh, along with a lot of blog posts and videos um, that we both provide to the community at large and what have you. So we, we think we are pretty qualified for this. We really love this, uh, this part of um, the process. And we hope that we can instill some of that passion through this presentation to show why this is super important and why you can also, even if you don't think, you know, this might slow you down, like we hope that this really shows how much um, the prototyping part of this is really both not just fun, but very uh, helpful and effective uh, in your end product. Okay, so I first wanna talk, as we're gonna, we're gonna get going now, um, we're gonna start with what is design thinking? Because prototyping is a part of a process. And if you haven't heard of design thinking, you're gonna get a quick down and dirty intro to it. So I first wanna ask, and uh, clearly I can't see any hands raised, so it's kind of tough, but <laughs> either way, think about it. Uh, who has ever heard of the design thinking double diamond? And you know, you're welcome to say in the chat, uh, yes or no, because I'd love to kind of get a perspective on that. Because I think there's a, a wide range of folks who have, depending on maybe what you do for in your, um, you know, Tableau role and or what your organization might, how, how you might use it. So essentially the double diamond is what you're seeing right here. And it's, uh, it's a process and a map that designers and developers can use to kind of organize the whole creative process and how they think through identifying a client's problem and getting to the solution. And uh, I want to say like long ago, but it's not really long ago, but a number of years ago, this process actually was into four sections. There was discovering, defining, um, it might've been like ideating and like, you know, testing and prototype, you know, this whole process on the right-hand side wasn't quite as defined this way. 
So let me talk through this really quickly. So discovery, if you are, are in an organization that um, does some of this, this might be familiar, but discovery tends to be when you're talking to a client or a stakeholder and trying to really identify what their problem is and understanding their language, you know, their, their metrics, their problems, what, what are they trying to solve for and making sure you understand that very clearly. So it's a lot of asking questions and listening to empathetically to answers. The second, so that is this divergence where you're just trying to get a lot of information. And then you do this convergence where you're ensuring that you're defining things identically to what your clients are defining things. And that whole process is making sure essentially you're really aligned so that you can then develop effectively. So we're not gonna talk a lot about that part of the thing of the um, double diamond, but what you'll see here is in that second double, double diamond, I don't know, say that 10 times fast, is this circular process. And as I was saying before, it was a very linear concept and folks over time said, you know what? This ideation phase is not linear. You don't just go from A to B, you really have to involve your stakeholders um, uh, you know, in, in this, right? So we talk about ideation, which is basically that creative process of putting a lot of things on the page and coming up with ideas. And then prototype and actually putting those ideas to fruition and then testing it with end user and saying, am I meeting your need? And if not, you're tweaking it, you're going back around the circle. Um, so this is really important because um, without this process of prototyping, you're like developing before you're really saying, hey, like, is this really going to answer your problems? And this is the solution you need. So I, I, lo I love the double diamond. I think it's a really helpful um, process to think about of how you get from the problem to the solution. Okay, so I'm up. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of different things today. We're going to be talking about, you know, why you should prototype, uh, how to go about it, best practices. Uh, but before we, we jump too much into the deep end, we just want to level set on what prototyping is to help you sort of better envision where it's going to fit in your process. Um, so on the next slide, yes, okay. Prototyping is a, a complete user experience without a fully developed dashboard and without any real data. So it's it's the realization of the dashboard without some of those key components. You know, maybe you're not uh, in your tool of choice yet. Maybe you don't have the data, which we'll get uh, more into a little bit later. Um, maybe you have both of those and there just isn't really like a clear vision. Um, starting with prototyping is going to allow you to ju jump straight in without all of those other pieces. And it's providing a, a high level view before you get too deep into development. Um, and as, as Lindsay covered, you know, um, in design thinking methodology, this is post discovery and, and definition. And we know at this point sort of what we're hoping to get at the end of the build, but that doesn't mean we know what it looks like. So with prototyping, we're creating a, a low fidelity uh, concept and we're pulling in some of the metrics or some of the charts and trying to map out more of what that layout's going to end up looking like. And um, so why does it sort of occur in in this place? Well, it allows um, it allows you to get the feedback necessary to to make the most useful product for your stakeholders as early as possible. Communication is really important. You'll probably hear me say that a bunch of times uh, during this presentation. Uh, it's necessary during the whole process. Uh, one thing I, I always say to people on my team is you could be the best developer in, in the whole world. And if you aren't good at communicating, you're just going to build um, the best dashboard that no one needs. And so being good at the communication piece um, means that you might not get it right the first time, but you're going to be listening to their feedback, uh, iterating on what you've created and put in front of them to hopefully get as close uh, to perfect at the end as you can. So, oh, wait, this might be, I oh, know. Um, so building prototypes, essentially like it takes the idea. So people communicate to you, Hey, look, I think I want this actually, Oh my God, a client came to me today. And was like, we have all these ideas and it's like all in like scratch. Right. And you know, this scratch paper is like, Hey, I, I have these ideas and it's very hard to communicate what you mean when you're just kind of like. I think I want this and I want that. So the prototype really makes this tangible because you are showing them in a visual way what they need or what they're looking for. 
right? And so you can say, hey, I'm going to put this here and this here, and this is going to do this. And they can see it and they can say, yeah, that actually, that makes a whole lot of sense. Or no, it doesn't. But when you're just communicating it verbally, it's very hard for a user to make a decision on if what you're thinking is what they're thinking and are you aligned on that? So prototyping makes that so much more perceptible. Uh, and then you can agree upon this design, this dashboard and develop faster. So, I'm sure people who don't do prototyping are thinking, this is just going to add to my time, right? Like this, this looks like it takes a long time to like, I got to do it in some tool and develop something and ask all these questions. And I can't just like take the data and run with it. Um, I'm going to say like pretty hard. No, it's not going to take more time. It's a different amount of time because you're balancing other alternatives of either you can make more time on the development end or on the prototyping end, but I don't think it ever will take more time. So first let's just talk about like what happens if you don't prototype. And this is an effort to say, if you're skeptical, let's just fine. Like, all right, what happens if you don't? So clearly if you don't prototype, you go from getting data to developing. Um, sweet. That's like our sweet spot. Most of you guys probably love Tableau. So that's where we want to go. Um, I used to do this all the time before I did prototyping years ago. I've been using Tableau for eight years, probably for the first six of it. This was my approach. Right? You just kind of like get in. The reality is that's fun and all, but you end up oftentimes, unless, I mean, you're maybe you're super amazing, but you hit it on the mark. It could happen, I guess, but you end up spending extra time building, rebuilding the dashboard and like editing it because someone says that's not right, or this isn't the right metric, or that's not the right color. Or, this is not right placement. Or, that's not right filter. And we all know Tableau is great and all, but you know, if you got to change it on like eight dashboards, that's a lot. Um, so you're going to, you might spend more time doing a lot of iteration in Tableau, which is not always as fast. Secondly, if you don't prototype, there is a reality of, great, you can just build in sort of secrecy <laughs> to some degree and like show this great product and say, hey, look at this. I made this whole thing. It looks fantastic. It works like this. It's great. And they will say, yeah, swell, good job. I'm glad you spent all this time on this, but we need to make X, Y, and Z changes. And so your excitement of finishing a development may not be um, the actual finished product because you got to go back around again and again, make some more changes. Another thing that could happen is again, if you're going straight from developing, perhaps to say, um, maybe you get development sign off, you did this great thing, you developed it and the stakeholders were like, yeah, sure. It looks good to us. And then you give it to your users, sort of the same kind of concept, publish it out. They're going to love this thing, right? I built this whole whole thing that they've never seen before. And that doesn't solve their problems because they weren't really involved in the prototyping process where you're like, hey, can you think now I'm gonna show you how this might work, what do you think? And again, we've gotta go back and make some iterations in Tableau, which as great of a tool it is, is not always um, as easy to make like wide sweeping changes. So uh, we've, talked a little bit about the what, and, and we're going to jump a little bit more into the why, but uh, I would love to hear from you guys in the chat if you guys are already doing this. So um, are you prototyping currently? If not, you know, is it something that you're interested in? Uh, if you aren't, hopefully we can sell you in the, in the next couple slides, but would be curious to hear sort of where people stand with it so far in their process. Um, and we're going to talk through some some reasons why you should. So number one, uh, it helps you start earlier. People get very excited by the idea of analytics. Obviously, all 95 people on this call on the analytics tug love analytics. Um, and they want to get started right away, which is, is really great. But development very easily can be a game of hurry up and wait. Um, all the necessary pieces might not be ready when you or your or your stakeholders are. So prototyping definitely helps to fill that gap. 
Um, going back to design thinking, this is an opportunity to sort of discuss how the solution will come together, um, which you know isn't dependent as um, isn't dependent on as many factors as you know the actual build is going to be. So if you want to keep that momentum and that excitement that all the stakeholders had to see the information, then this is going to be a great option. And like Lindsay said, it also is going to be easier for them to communicate uh, when there's uh, something in front of them. Uh, I like to think it's pretty similar to when someone asks you what you want to eat and you're sort of like, I don't know. <laughs> I never know when someone asks me that, but then someone's like, oh, you know, we can go here or here. And it's, it's a lot easier when there's something tangible. It's a lot easier. Um, so definitely uh, gets the, the communication going. Which is one of the next points, which it can also help you communicate your needs. So um, I discussed in the previous one, you know, maybe you don't have data right away. Uh, if you are in that situation, this could be a great uh, opportunity to communicate your needs for the data structure or included fields and being able to dictate some of that can definitely help alleviate you know the needs for joining or complex calculations which are not only going to slow down uh, your development but it's also probably going to slow down the performance of your dashboard which nobody loves um, and this is a, a great jumping off point too to uh, discuss what's realistic because you know stakeholders, they want everything possible that there absolutely can be, and, and they might not necessarily be collecting all of that. So if you can get ahead of that a little bit, um, it definitely helps reduce friction later on. Uh, and uh, while we're talking about time too, um, you know, like I said, your, your users probably want their dashboard as soon as possible. They actually probably want it 15 minutes ago, but that's probably not going to be, not going to be capable. But the next best thing that you can get them is to just get it as soon as you can. And What's nice about prototyping is it provides a roadmap and the benefit of this is that it allows you to better estimate timeframes because you know exactly what you're building towards. Uh, you can even break it down and use your wireframe as a reference to let them know like when specific pieces are going to be available so they can play around even sooner. Um, and this is going to help them make sure all the necessary parties are available too to test. Um, and they can communicate as well if there's specific pieces that they'd like to see earlier than others. So if there's something that's really important to them, they could say, hey, you know, looking forward to all of this, but this piece is, is of importance to us. So if we can start with that one sooner, um, they can communicate that too. Yeah, and I, I love what Autumn just saying about like even the timeframes and stuff, because when you're building um, the prototypes, as you and Tableau know, uh, what things are gonna take longer and like how to work the, through this, this whole process. And this gets you to the, that user testing, like we're, you know also what you're building because you've prototyped it. And you're like, hey, like I know that what I've designed here is a X, Y, or Z. It's a parameter, it's a sheet swap, it's a whatever, it's a tool tip, like yada, yada. And then when you do user testing, you can um, build all that in and say, I want to make sure that I'm testing a user on this piece of this dashboard, uh, this metric. I want to make sure they understand this chart and this interactivity and you do it before you actually do the build because if it's not going to work, like if they don't get it, you want to tweak that before you build it, right? Like so, you want to you want them to come back to you and say, "Yeah, this this is fantastic. This makes a whole lot of sense." Or this is like this one is not quite right, and you can make those adjustments before you build it. That I find super helpful because I don't want to go down the road of building something that is super confusing to a user or is not meeting their need versus knowing before I build it. Because we all know, like I said, you could end up building something that is complicated and I'd rather know earlier. Um, next is prototyping helps prevent scope creep. So um, this is a big one because when you don't have prototyping, you are just developing. And it feels kind of, in my opinion, a black box of um, I'm building something and kind of checking in with a client to say, what do you think of this? Right. And then they're like, oh, and I want this instead. Or like that. Oh, I really like that. I want more of that. Right. And like these things can continue to like build and potentially add a lot more time to your, your development or your process. When you do prototyping, you can say, hey, this is the design that we agreed upon. And this design, um, you know, I mean, think about it. It's like, it looks like a dashboard, right? Like, and we'll show you this later. Like it's a design, but it's saying, hey, we are going to build this view and this chart and this interactivity. And these are going to be the ways that you can interact with it. And so that allows you to say, when they come back and say, well, actually I want a whole nother dashboard and a whole nother thing. You're like, we agreed on this. 
you want that, that's great. Put that in phase two or add that to like, you know, our scope of work. But it allows you to keep really focused on what you're here and they agreed to, uh, to build and accomplish. And lastly, obviously, as we kind of said, it helps you build faster in Tableau because essentially you have this huge blueprint. It's like if you've seen something on Tableau Public before and you're like, I would love to recreate that. You essentially have all the designs, you know, you have exactly how you have to have a layout. All you got to do is like replicate it. That's actually a lot easier than thinking about it from scratch. So you've done all the hard work and all you got to do is build it in Tableau. And if you're the one that is also doing the um, prototyping or you have someone who's prototyping who knows Tableau, they've known that what they've built or you've built in the prototype can be possible in Tableau. That is also a very key part of it. But it makes the build faster, which is um, very rewarding. Okay, so we've talked about the what and the why, and now we need to talk about the how, or the how much, I guess in this case, how much effort should you put in? And that does depend on what, when, and where you are in this process. So we tend to talk about three different types of visual fidelity, like low, medium, high. And so imagine the low is like the back of the napkin, quick all drawing. This is something you're putting on the whiteboard on a piece of paper. Uh, that's really good, obviously, in the beginning. There's medium, which, you know, essentially like has some concepts, like it might be a line chart, it might be whatever, it might be this metric, but like nothing's like super defined. Maybe there's not colors, maybe there's not real titles, maybe there's not quite an understanding of like what we're analyzing. And then high fidelity is essentially going to look like what you're going to build. Um, it's probably got the right branded colors, the right metrics, probably the right titles, you know, things are in the right places. Uh, you're essentially hoping that the data, like you want the data to match what you're going to kind of build. So when should you do each of these? Because any of those low, medium, high are appropriate in different places. You don't always want to build high fidelity designs. I mean, that would take you a lot of time and that's totally not necessary all the time. So in the early stage of an engagement with a client, let's say that's in your discovery phase we talked about earlier, like you're just trying to like understand somebody, you may be like putting some sketches on the back of the napkin because you're like, all right, I just want to like make sure I'm kind of on the right track. And that's where you're doing these kind of low proof of concepts. Like, hey, these are kind of the metrics we want. And, you know, maybe it's like in Excel or maybe it's on a paper, like maybe it's in PowerPoint. You're just trying to like get some groundwork, right? This is like early stage. You want low fidelity there. The other phase is like potentially um, a post-design phase. So sometimes um, you could have already a design that comes to you. Like someone already has a dashboard where they're saying, hey, we need this fix. The design is okay, right? Like you're modifying it. So you already have something to build upon. Or maybe it's that the design was already done, but here you are to like bring it to fruition. This is where you're going to want to do that more high fidelity or medium fidelity, like high interact or high fidelity, uh, medium interactivity. Sorry, this means interactivity is a little lightning bolts. Um, you could do an interactivity if you have that kind of um, platform available where you can say, hey, like I took your design and now I'm going to show you what it's really going to do. I'm going to show you what it looks like when you make this switch, when you make this parameter change, when you go to this dashboard, like this is what is going to happen. That helps people really conceptualize potentially um, like a guided analytic flow that when I go here, I go here, that kind of stuff. And the last one might be pre-development. So that is when you're actually going to hand something over to a developer. Now, if you are the developer, then that might be different because well, it's still might be the same, but the point of here is like, if you are a designer and you're handing it over to somebody else who's design uh, developing, you really want the highest fidelity type of prototype so that everything is super clear um, in terms of what it's going to look like down to, like I said, like the colors, the layout, the, the exact filters, the exact metrics, the exact chart types, all these things, the exact interactivity. When I click this, what's going to happen? Right, that is super high fidelity because you need someone to just take it and run. Uh, especially if, again, it's not you, then 
you want that to be so, super clear. Uh, so I know you guys are all super excited about prototyping now. You guys are, are probably ready to, to get started. You're like, Autumn, I'm getting off this tug. I'm going to go prototype this very second. Well, wait, wait. First, Ray's going to give a great presentation after this. But also, uh, we're going to talk through what's probably the next step after deciding that you want to include prototyping in your process, which is picking a tool, uh, which there are some people talking about uh, in the chat. And it's not it's not a one-size-fits-all, uh, similar to what um, Lindsay was talking about with the level of effort and the fidelity. It, it's going to depend. So instead of saying, hey, this is the tool that you guys should use, I'm going to talk through some questions that you guys should be asking yourself to figure out which tools not only going to fit you, but also fit the project that you're on or maybe the stakeholder that you're working with. So question number one is uh, about accessibility. So what's the what's the barrier to entry? Um, this is going to be you know pretty personal to you as um, as the developer. We're trying to get to the bottom of with this question is you know how easily can you get started? Some things you want to consider are you know is this tool or option, I guess, available uh, within your organization? Uh, is there a cost associated? If so, you know, what's the process to get that approved through your company? Do you already know how to use it? Um, I, I mean, Lindsay would agree with me too. You know, prototyping is, is worth the time investment to pick up a methodology that's going to work for you and that's gonna service you as you're building dashboards, but that doesn't mean you have the time, like right then. It might mean something that you're working up towards. So if you need to hit the ground running in that moment, might want to go with something you're more familiar with. Um, and as Lindsay said, you can always transition to a different option in a later stage. Question number two is around adoption. So what's the existing experience? Uh, the previous one was more about you and, and this question is more about the people on the receiving end. So, you know, what are their current expectations? Uh, if there are any around prototyping and what it's going to look like. You know, if you're going with an option that's new to them, what sort of user training are you going to need to do? Again, you know, I think a good prototyping process is worth, worth the investment, but not all stakeholders are open to new things. And again, you know, it might not fit within the timeline that you, you need for that particular project. So understanding what you need to do to work with your stakeholder to get them um, sort of up with the prototyping process is, is an important consideration as well. Third time, I mentioned time in the past too, so I, uh, it's good that it got its its own dedicated one. Um, but the last two are more about you know the time to get there, and this one's more about the actual execution. So how quickly could you turn around an MVP? Uh, as we covered earlier, prototyping doesn't you know inherently lengthen lengthen your process, uh, but it could if you're not you know mindful about your choices. Um, another thing that I think is really important to remember here, and something that people pass up all the time when they're thinking about it is update time. So when you're thinking about time, don't just think about, you know, how quickly can I make a prototype? Uh, we talked a lot about iteration being really important to this part of the process. If you're going to iterate, it means you're probably gonna have to either go back and fix it or do it again, because not all options uh, are going to let you fix it. So that's something that needs to be uh, factored in as well when you're deciding how long something's going to take. Number four, accuracy. Um, so how close is it to the end product? Uh, the only thing that's going to be exactly on it would be making the, the dashboard itself, uh, but some options are going to get you closer than others. So it's a spectrum, right? So decide where on the spectrum you need to get to get the necessary feedback from your users. Um, this will also be where some of the principles that Lindsay talked about around fidelity factor in, uh, but figuring out how accurate you can get with that particular prototyping option um, will be an important question you need to ask yourself. And lastly, collaboration. So we've I'll probably hit you uh, over the head with talking about communication and iteration and how important that is to this. Um, but understanding how you can distribute the prototype uh, is really important as well. So how easily can you share it out to get that feedback that you need from others? Because um, that's that's what makes, makes it important. So that's something you need to think about when picking your tool. And here are some options. So pen and paper is one that was discussed heavily in chat. Whiteboarding, I know some of us are back in office in many places, but there are also whiteboarding tools. Slides, so if you're using uh, Google Slides or, or PowerPoint, wireframing tools. Uh, so like I said, Lindsay and I like Figma, but there's there's Miro, there's um, I think Snagit, there are other ones, and then the BI tool. You can prototype within you know, Tableau or Power BI or the sort of the end destination. And we're showing a little marker here across those, those five, uh, 
key components that you should think about if we think it's good in that area. If there's a half circle, it means it is sort of good. So for example, pen and paper gets a half circle because time-wise um, it's quick. You could do it really quickly. You could sketch something up really quickly, but like I said, updating is, is equally as important. And if they say, hey, you know, can you move that over here? And I don't really like this you're probably going to have to start over or make lots of big scratches. Uh, so it only gets a half circle for that one. Uh, but as you can see, there's not a single one of these that's absolutely perfect. Some went out in some categories over others. So figure out what's most important for you, for your stakeholders, for this particular project, for your timeline, uh, and pick the one that can best support you there. All right. So last we're going to talk about a few best practices to get you going, kind of hopefully into the wild of prototyping um because we've covered a bunch in these short few minutes so let's talk about a couple of these so all right best practice number one understanding your data limitations so this is huge because um typically or, or I, I i like to have i like to prototype before i actually know necessarily the data because sometimes a prototype can inform the data now it depends on what you're doing and sometimes it may be that someone's coming to you with data that's already together and then you're prototyping off of that but either way uh you really want to understand kind of those limitations because you don't want to design something that's not possible based on what the data has right like you're not going to say I'm gonna build a view of monthly data when their lowest aggregation is annual. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So you do need to know some things. So it's really important to have these conversations and ask about that lowest level of granularity and all of the metrics and things that might exist so that you can prototype accurately. Best practice number two. So secondly, is that, you know, when, when and if you were to prototype in Tableau, you know, you might have the actual data. And so things potentially might look the way they should um, in terms of what your client might expect from the data. In a prototype, when you're prototyping, you don't have the data and you may not actually be familiar with what is a realistic data point. So don't make it up is the bottom line because as much as we don't want it to be the case, users or clients or stakeholders will always look at it and get distracted by something that is completely outside of their realm of reality. That number would never be that high. That percentage is inaccurate. We don't have anybody named Sean Miller here. You know, he only works at Superstore. <laughs> um, so the best practice is just put in some placeholders, put in some X's, put in some percentage, just let them know that, hey, this is gonna be a value, this is gonna be percent, this is gonna be a change, et cetera. It'll help them focus on the design, not the numbers. Numbers will come later. Number three is be clear on communicating why you're doing something. So you are the designer and potentially also the developer. So that means potentially you're the one that also knows how Tableau functions. So you don't want to say to someone, hey, like, you know, here's your prototype. You know, this is what you want. Uh, instead, you want to really be clear. Like, I know you want to do this. This is why I decided to make the dashboard look like this with this chart, this functionality. This is what is going to best meet your needs. And this is why we're doing it this way because Maybe it's, this is what's possible in Tableau and this other option is not, right? So communicate it. It helps your end user and your stakeholder really buy into your prototype and understand what they're gonna get in the end. This one's on. This is me? <laughs> yes. Okay, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to blame it on being late. Um, <laughs> good, good thing I've done this a couple of times, so I know this one, um, obviously, <laughs> because it's apparently my slide. Uh, so, you know, we we talked about arts earlier not putting every... Huh? So you're chatting about arts and crafts. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> Sam got me with the, with the cut and paste. Um, so, you know, talked about earlier, obviously you can't put everything in. If you put everything in, you just built the dashboard that wasn't actually prototyping. And some things just aren't going to be helpful to put in. I think a great example of that is like a filter action. You know, it's going to be great interactivity wise in the end dashboard. It's probably not going to add that much to 
mock that up in your in your prototype or in your wireframe. But it is really important that you're calling that out when you're talking to your stakeholders because you want them to be able to envision during this process what the whole experience is going to be like. So um, this main best practice is to say, you know, it's okay to leave those things out, but just make sure that you're communicating it to them so they can understand that's there. If not, you'll probably get questions like, oh, but I need to see this uh, sometimes just for one particular state. And so if you say, oh, well, if you click on the map for a state, it'll filter this table just to that state. And they're going to understand that what they're seeing in the prototype um, is going to be able to be manipulated with some other things. And again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, so you're going to want to keep it as conversation, conversational uh, as you can. The biggest benefit of adding prototyping to your process is you know, gaining alignment on how your work is going to meet the needs of uh, your stakeholders and you know, really leverage this as an opportunity to further emphasize the importance of you know, best reporting practices. Um, and gather feedback on what is or isn't working and then implement that and, and at the end definitely get sign off you know it's it doesn't need to be just a, it can be just a personal process for you to sort of get your ideas down, but it's going to benefit you the most when you're you're having that conversation with your stakeholder and um, seeing what they think and making sure that you know it is in line with their needs and is going to best support them and the company. So demo time. If you guys have never seen Figma, um, you're about to see it really quickly. <laughs> so um, we took a data set. I gathered the requirements from myself because I was the stakeholder. Uh, and then I prototyped it in Figma. So we're going to take a look at that. Let's see if I can. All right. So yeah, this is uh, Autumn's build. Let's see. There we go. Yes, so uh, I I used to call Figma a fancy PowerPoint. I don't know if that's like a good way to describe it, but um, there are a lot of things that are really great about it. As Lindsay said, you know, it, it's really collaborative, so people can come in and comment straight on um, the prototype that you made. I like it because making changes is really easily really easy. So when you are going back and forth, um, it's super simple. Duplicating things is really great too. So I had a general idea of, of what I wanted for. Um, from this this dashboard and you know what we did is I made the prototype then I passed it along to Lindsay and she made the real dashboard from it but as you can see I'm, I'm making a an area chart here to do some trending which is something that we we commonly see and I'm just using fake points um I answered this in the the Q&A but um I don't you know normally use data in the prototyping process it's just supposed I just use it to get the idea of hey you know we're going to understand this metric uh, rolled up to the year level, and then we'll see year over year underneath it, and then we'll also be able to see it over time, and and there'll be a, a table on the side. Uh, what do you mean slow down? This is I actually <laughs> built it that fast, Adele. I'm just <laughs> lightning speed. No, um, yeah, I mean I can release. I think I have real time prototype build videos out, but can release it. Um, but yeah, so that was me me building the prototype. You saw how quickly that came together, and now Lindsay's gonna show the tableau version. Yeah, so she just gave me that like end design. Um, I didn't see like necessarily the whole process, and I, she gave me the data set and said, "Have at it, build what I made." So that's what we did. Um, so you'll see what's interesting is like once you have someone lay out this framework of what metrics have to go where, what it looks like in the frame and like the layout. Like I was way more easy, easier to say, okay, like I have to have this kind of container and these are the same, the charts that are going to look the same. So I'm faster at saying, you just saw it really quickly. I like duplicate the same sheet and like change the metrics as you know to do, but I didn't have to think about that in advance. I was able to just quickly, this is like really super speed, um, quickly do some of these things. And, you know, you see here, like the data doesn't look exactly, like she's just giving fake data. This is the real data. And now we're going to see how it actually shows up. But, you know, that's the whole process of prototyping is you don't need it. And then we developed it. Um, it was, I didn't have to think about anything. Like, you know, that stress sometimes you get when you have to like build something like, oh, what do I have to, what is it going to look like? And where am I put what? And is it all going to fit in the end? It was like, no, Autumn just said, this is how you have to do it. And I'm like, that makes it easy. And uh, I think that relieves the stress of like trying to work it all out. Um, so I knew it. All the titles are going to be and the colors and that made it um pretty simple and so you'll see at the end this looks like our design and now it's built in tableau oh let me see it again 
All right. So with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you so much. And I don't know, folks, if we want to have time for questions or what, but um, yeah, that was it. So hopefully that was inspiring. <laughs> I mean, yeah, great job. Um, I had not seen this, so it was good to see you guys do this uh, live. One question for sure, and then I may take up another one, but um, there was some back and forth on whether, like what kinds of data sets to use for prototyping, are there dummy data sets? resources it seems like in your best practices you kind of say like don't use real like real or fake data use nothing just kind of templates would love to hear your perspective on are there data sets you should use even superstore data or just like completely don't use numbers so if you're going to use a tool like i mean think about it. if you're using like pen and paper like you can't using data is not really applicable and the same kind of goes with like any kind of like PowerPoint or a whiteboard or, or Figma, like Autumn showed the options that we were kind of proposing. Obviously, if you're prototyping in a BI tool, which is like the last one in that, um, you know, slide, then you can use real data, I guess, because you're prototyping in the tool. But generally, then you wouldn't have the ability to really prototype in the tool because you don't have the data. And I actually find that a lot more freeing. Um, however, I will caveat that with saying, there's been a number of times where clients might say, you know, what you're proposing, like you haven't seen exactly how our data is going to show up. And that particular design may not quite like work the way you think it's going to. And that's true. And so sometimes we say, all right, like that's fair. Um, we'll, we're going we're to have to sometimes see what the data looks like. But, you know, when I prototype, I'm not using real data. I'm using the concepts, the metrics, and the, the reality is the end goal of what a user or a stakeholder is hoping to achieve from the, you know, the dashboard and solve their problems. So I don't know, Autumn, if you have any other thoughts. Yeah, I try to stay, stay away from the data while prototyping it if I can, because it's both distracting to me and it's distracting to the stakeholder. Um, I will say the one time where I do like to lean on it is if there is like very, complex calculations that are necessary, or if they're asking for something I'm not sure is possible and I want to test it out first, because uh, I don't want to put anything in the prototype that I can't deliver because I'm normally the person prototyping and doing the development. So that's normally where I will bring in uh, data if I need to, to say, tell myself I can do it. Or also if I know I need to make a compromise, I might bring it so I could say, this is as far as I can get towards what you're asking. Either your data isn't going to allow that uh, or Tableau isn't going to allow that. And this is as close as I can get. Sometimes being in the tool is easier for those conversations. But just out, out, I'm just I have a question out too. You're saying like, you'll bring that into like Tableau or something to like check something that you're prototyping. Yes. I mean, so if yeah. I can find fake data, like if the, the client's data isn't available yet, fake data that's sort of structured or at least has the same right. values that's going to be similar, then I'll bring it in and be like, can, is, can I actually right. <laughs> build those yeah, calculations? And build it. Yeah. I'm like, is this real? <laughs> that's Will I have to use magic? Sometimes. Sometimes. Cool. Um, I think in the interest of time, We'll we'll keep it there. Uh, there are there were a couple of questions I think that floating through the Q and A. So if you guys do notice them, um, feel free to to take those. But otherwise, I'm gonna let Sam introduce Ray and and talk through our other discussion. Yeah, cool. thank, thank you so much, Autumn and Lindsay. We so appreciate um, your insights there on prototyping. Uh, it's just it was a fantastic session and thank you everybody for all of your thoughts in the chat keep it up it's um it's really great um to learn more things in the chat as well um as the the presentation so i'd like to introduce today ray givler um ray is a prolific uh poster on linkedin so if you have if you are not following him you should he um just provides fantastic content, um, some some sort of long form thoughts, some just really great little snippets, um, tiny tips of Tableau. Um, it, it's not just Tableau as well, it's, you know, really right across um, the kind of whole ecosystem of what we do. 
Um, but yeah, Ray and I have chatted over LinkedIn and so he, we're lucky enough to, um, to have him today. He's going to be presenting on Benchmarker. Um, so an AB um, set comparison tool, which should be fantastic. Um, I wanted to talk quickly with Ray. Um, Ray, are you on? Um, I don't know if I can see your video. I'm assuming you are. Um, yeah, I'm on and I'm yep. off. <laughs> there you go. Um, I see you have an IMDb writing credit for a low budget horror film. Can you just, <laughs> I'm fascinated. Can you expand upon that. Yeah. How yeah, for several you? years, I, I tried to be a, a screenwriter and I got um, just one little tiny break where I got paid a little bit of money to write a script uh, for a low budget horror film. And I was kind of uh, the hero of many other struggling writers who got no, nowhere, but it kind of ended there. And uh, it is not very good. Like a third of the way through the shooting, the lead actress left and they had to totally change the story. So what you see, if you see it out there is not uh, really close to what I wrote, but. Uh, that kind of sounds amazing that it's uh, almost, uh, yeah, schlock horror. And uh, it sounds like real, real fun. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is, uh, what is a super taster? You said, you oh, it, it's taste. somebody with really sensitive taste buds. So like as a kid, I could not even eat spaghetti because the tomato sauce was too spicy for me. Wow. Um, and that just kind of for most people kind of go reduces over time as you get older. And it, it there's a, a big uh, association with bitterness, like your bitterness really is, is uh, something that super tasters are sensitive to. So you will not find me drinking any IPAs. I am not experiencing the same thing that you do when you drink it. <laughs> that is fascinating, actually. And uh, we're getting some really great compliments on your t-shirt that's in that picture there as well. Yeah, um, the crazy thing about that is that um, uh, Dustin Schimmick gave me that for participating in something. I don't remember what. So I just threw it out there on LinkedIn. And that was one of my most popular posts of all time. It's in the top five easily. I think I got like 30 or 40,000 views or something. Just crazy. That's crazy. But the, I, I really love that shirt. I think it yeah, speaks to a lot of us. That's fantastic. All right. Well, we'll um, hand over to you, Ray. And thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate having you here in the session. And um, you can take us through Benchmarker. Thanks. All right. Guys, I am going to share my entire screen. And what I'm going to be doing is jumping, jumping back and forth between PowerPoint and um, a little bit with Tableau Public and then uh, the Tableau Public desktop to show you how things are done. So uh, thanks for that great introduction, uh, Sam. And it is a pleasure to be speaking in the number one, according to the Vizies, Tableau user group in the world. So good morning and good evening to everybody out there. So how to make a dynamic benchmarker in Tableau. That is what we are talking about today. I'm going to talk about the motivation, like why did I make this thing and some use cases for the benchmarker itself. Give you a quick tour of the version that's out there on Tableau Public. And it's based on sets. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sets. I'm not the grandmaster of sets, but I can point you to resources as well. And it's interesting, I kind of added that because I presented this once before and people started asking me questions about sets and I was kind of hemming and hawing. So <laughs> at least there's a little background there. And then I'll get into exactly how to build this thing. Uh, not quite click for click, but pretty close. And then we're gonna wrap up. So really the motivation for this thing was, um, I like to sit in on my customers meetings and see what they're talking about, uh, understand how the business is working, what are their challenges. And one of my customers was making a presentation and he had two side-by-side -side screenshots of the same dashboard, one with one set of filters and one with another. So I was thinking, you know, at this point, I didn't know much about sets, but I heard about them and I thought, man, there, there ought to be a way to, you know, just show those both at the same time on the same screen. So 
that was really my goal. So kind of, if you can imagine like set A on the one side, some sort of intersection of products, geography and time, or it could be any, any dimensions here, right? And another choice, you know, something you're comparing it to in a set B. So um, I went off and tried to build this thing. And what I modeled it after, here's a little screenshot from a Penn State game a couple uh, weeks ago. Penn State got kind of manhandled by Michigan. This was a, a disappointment to the Penn State fans. But often in sports, you will see a comparison of the two teams like this, right? There'll be some sort of um, criteria or, or element of the game down the center and numbers on the side. And if it's a team level thing, often they'll have like a check mark on each side who has the advantage, you know, in, in what aspect of the game. So that is what um, kind of was my design goal in this. And because it's called head to head, you know, it kind of shows the head to head matchup in sports. Internally, I, this is actually called the head to head dashboard. So what we use it for is comparing like part to whole. You could compare a site to an entire enterprise. You can compare something in one geography to another. You can compare peer to peer, peer to a set of peers. Or if you think in real estate, like comps, you want your comparable houses, something like that. You can also compare uh, across time periods. It doesn't have to be the same slice of data. So I am going to show this now uh, and, and keep in mind, well, I'm, Let's just get over to a benchmarker. Here it is. It's out there on Tableau Public. And um, I mean, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat here. Oh, just some goodbyes. Good. So what we have here, one thing that to keep in mind is um, it's two sets of intersecting set criteria. So down the middle, this is kind of the sports thing I was talking about. Here are our, our metrics that we want to um, compare in, in our two different uh, slices of the data. And oh, we're reloading, nice. <laughs> and we have the numeric value for the orange. So everything in set A here is, an, is in orange, everything in set B is blue. And whoever has the superior metric gets the check mark here. That's where the advantage is. And then the uh, charts on the side are just supporting information. You could put whatever makes sense to you there. But here, this is furniture in the central region versus furniture in all other regions. So if I click on this set of, this group of set definitions, again, these aren't filters. These are sets and I have furniture and I have central region and everything else is set to all, okay? And these are just um, show hide buttons in for vertical containers here. And then I also have on this side, uh, a parameter at the top and, and this is furniture. And like it says here for, the remaining regions, east, south, and west, everything else is set to all. Um, and what you get then, the, the users can put a logical name in that parameter for their set A or set B, a little descriptive thing, and it's put in the title. And then they got the summary view. So if they want to, you know, back to that motivation, the guy's presentation, the, the two things, he can just take one screenshot of this, dump in his presentation and speak to what it means. Uh, if this thing I added at the bottom is a useful little tool. It shows you the intersection between A and B. If there is any, there's no intersection here. And the percent of total orders. I should have said this is all based, if you didn't recognize it, on Superstore. And, and the orders data set. So set A, 6.6%. Set B, 13.9%. Uh, let's change this a little bit here. Let's expand. Uh, let's make region uh, A the regions for set A be central and east and apply that. And I just added these apply things and these borders. I don't know if I like it. You design, design it the way you like. You know, there's lots of choices here. So you'll notice that 13.9 came down proportionally, right? So now because they both have east in their list, there's a 5.1% intersection. So this could be useful. And um, I'm, it's actually not part of the presentation how to build it but it's in the dashboard and you can check it out. And in case I forget, so that I don't forget to say it, almost every step in here is in this how to tab, but I'm also gonna cover all that this evening. It's been worded a little, hopefully more clearly in, in the PowerPoint, but that's the general idea of Benchmarker. If we want more examples later, I can show them. But in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving here.
So in the intro to sets, I'm, I'm gonna take this up to a really 50,000 foot level to think about it and think in terms kind of philosophically here, what is analytics? We're in the analytics tug. So this seems apropos. And I really break it into four high level concepts, right? We are either assigning some entities to groups and we might do that to, via any of these methods, filtering, decomposition, right? Uh, uh, groups themselves in Tableau, classification, clustering, or sets, right? Which we're gonna talk about more. And, or we're either grouping things, defining things, uh, relationships between groups. And again, many ways we can do that, hierarchies, rankings, trends, or sets also do that, as well as some of the other things listed here. Then we measure those groups or those relationships. And I'm going to show you how to use sets in um, measures. And then lastly, are there any insights? So the, these are kind of our guiding high level approaches to analytics. So how about sets in Tableau? This is Ray Givler's uh, definition of sets. I say it's a useful group of rows in your data source. So what you use it for, you know, that depends. Um, but the, the best way to learn about this is, is look at uh, use cases that are out there, work through them, and then hopefully you will see how they can work uh, analogously to, to solve problems in your domain. They can be leveraged in calculated fields or hierarchies. They can be defined in different ways. So when you go to uh, establish your set, you can do top and bottom, top and bottom 10, and whatever that is. You can do it by field values like um, profit, bottom by sales. You can make it conditional, right? Uh, above a certain threshold. And it, what I'm doing is mostly this uh, custom value list where you're just selecting items to either be in or not be in the set. It's kind of the most basic way to do it. They can be defined dynamically by graph selection. So on your worksheet, you can use set actions so that what you select in the graph is, um, is the definition of your set. And you can add or uh, clear the values in there. I'm not gonna get into all the, the nitty gritty of all that because that's almost a subject in itself. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that sets are resolved before dimension filters in Tableau's order of operations. So a little more about sets. You may have used groups. So like, how are they different from groups? Uh, the main difference here is, or at least one key one, is that a, a single dimensional value can only be in one group, but a dimensional value like snake could exist in multiple sets. It can be in reptiles, slithering things, most feared animals, or my daughter's pets. She only has one snake, thank goodness. Sets versus, versus filters. So how, how are they different from filters? Well, filters are actually removing rows from your worksheet, right? So once you filter to say um, uh, central region, right? All the other ones, east, south, whatever, they're gone. Uh, whereas sets apply across the data source and, and the workbook. So for filters, you can use that setting show relevant values. You can't show relevant values in sets because no rows have been removed. It's never going to change. You're, again, you're using the entire data set. And when you have multiple filters, they are always anded, right? You have to meet all the criteria. Sets, you could be anded, ORD, or other combinations. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about those in a moment. And another thing to remember about sets, and really the key to how this whole thing works, is um, that sets are cousins of Booleans, right? They can only have two values, in or out. So some common usage cases that are out there are these three, and these are actually all out of the first link, and I can distribute this um, deck. I, I'm not sure how I'll coordinate with the um, tug leaders for how to get it out to people if they're interested. But three common use cases here are this dynamic drill down where if you look at the second level here, 
um, office supplies is expanded, technology is not, it's just null. So if that would be useful for you, check out this first link, all three of these are in there. The next one is called proportional brushing or what Ray calls how much of this is that. So when we select East here at the top of this dashboard, uh, it shows what percent of the orders, right, for each of these subcategories are in, from the Eastern region. Very common one. And then uh, lastly, market ba basket analysis. And that's what that means is for people who bought product A, what other products were bought with it. So in this example, they selected accessories and then accessories. They're kind of double dipping here because this is also showing proportional brushing. What proportion of accessories is uh, associated with these binders, papers, or other subcategories? There's another good video that has <clears throat> additional set use cases. And again, I encourage you to get out there and, and click and work through these. I still need to do more of them myself to, to get better at it. But Eric Parker, so I reached out to him and talked to him about this. And he has an interesting one where you may see null in your list when you, in your filter list, when you have um, certain joins and blends and you know, like you can't get rid of it and there's no reason for it to be there. Well, you can get rid of it and he'll show you how with sets. And you can do like an interesting top 10 plus other and you know, top and bottom five on the same list. So check those out, definitely worth uh, viewing. Here's an interesting thing. So sets combining sets, right? The way you can do this is um, if you go over to uh, select a set, let's go over to desktop here and let's get into a, a graph. Let's get into a, a worksheet and pick one of the sets here. Close that off. Um, order priority set A. If I right click this and um, Select create. Hold on a second. Why am I not seeing here? Create. I, I don't know why it's not showing me the combined set there right now, but this is the form that usually shows up. And you can give a name to your combined set and it can have any of these four values, which um, are basically anding the two sets or oring the two sets together, right? Anding, do I need to select two sets first? I don't believe how, how it worked yesterday. They do, they do have to be of the same dimension. I can try that. Create, <laughs> there you go, that's better. Create combined set. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, because that's not how these are put together. So I don't really use that a lot, but thanks. So there you go, same form as in the PowerPoint. So the first one is or, right? It's in either set. Second one is and, the intersection. Uh, third one, it's um, A, not B. That's actually uh, same as the anti-join in SQL, pretty cool. Last one, B, not A. So those are your main choices when you're doing a traditional combination of uh, sets and they have to be on the same dimension. So you can see the two that I selected are both customer segments. So that's why that's okay. Uh, but what we're going to do, right, is actually make one that is combining different dimensions, right? So let's let's get into it. For these are the steps, and there's ten steps. So for each dimension of the groups that you want to I shouldn't really say filter there, but that you want to uh, create your um, superset by, it's not really a superset, the, uh, the, the cross section of all your sets. You want to, we could do a customer name here, right? We could create set, right? And we want to use all, and you can say like customer name set A. That's step one. And you can see the ones that I did to this with below. Then basically you want to duplicate that, right? And make a, uh, another version. Let's edit that. Um, well, I could have done it right over there in the data pane, but let's make this set B, right? I can double slowly click it and then click it again over here. We could have changed the name over there. We want to do that for each of the dimensions that we're interested 
in creating our, our sets by. Then we're gonna create a Boolean, right? This is the key right here, a Boolean calculated field for set A and set B, and they are going to and together all our dimensions. So let's look down here, set A, we're gonna edit it. And this is where I would really like to, if double, I've been using Tableau five or six years and I still double click a calculated field to edit it. And that doesn't open an edit box that adds it to the um, worksheet, whatever. So anyhow, here it is, set A, all these, right? Set B, if we edit that, it's all B. So we're anding them all together. Anything that's in set B has got to meet all those criteria. Then for each measure that we want to compare across sets A and B, we are going to create calculated field. We can go to the, the, the source measure, right? Say it was discount, right? We can right click it We can create calculated field. And then in here, we would say like if set A, then discount end. Now that is just a straightforward calculation. So we would call this whatever, discount set A. But so if we go back over, let, let's, let's look at the, the full thing here over in, in Tableau Public. Like uh, just a, a, a raw measure like that does not tell us much if we sum. Because if these are different sizes, if our sets are different sizes, right? The bigger set is going to have the most sales, the most orders, and the greatest total profit. So for any tool like this, you are better off with ratios. So that's why I used all ratios in here: days to ship, orders, uh, sales per order, and profit ratio. Um, I'm really big on ratios. I have another um, dashboard out there you may want to check out called Gap to Goal, um, and that's that's a separate presentation, but useful for sure. So simple one you make like this. If it's a ratio, like I mentioned, you want more of this format where you have your numerator and your denominator and that condition goes inside each aggregation, right? If set A, then our thing else, or actually nothing else. And because we want it to be null otherwise. And after you do that, right, you want to right click that new calculated field, duplicate it, right? We're going to duplicate. I got this. I'm going to do it the other way here. Change it right here, B. And the one thing you don't want to forget, right, come in here, edit it, and change this to set B. I did have an error on this dashboard in the public originally where I forgot to do that on one of them. So be careful that you want to do that. Oh, and I talked about rates right there. Good. So what we want to do after we have all our measures set up is create a worksheet for each AB measure pair. All right. And what I did is use measured values and measure names. And if we get, and you can see that um, right here. So they're both like this. You could do it in other ways. And the actual like the, the, the real production version of this, I have bar and bar. And I actually have the... Um, I don't, I, I hide the, the row headers here and I have the name of it right in the bar and they're kind of overlapping and they're 50% um, uh, opaque each. So you can, you know, use your imagination, use what's clear to your users, whatever you, whatever you like. But you're gonna have, bottom line here, you're gonna make a graph like this with each of these measures that you set up so you can compare each individual measure. So I did that for these three different measures down the center of this graph. That's step four. Step five. Now, this is where we set up our cool check marks here, right, to show which is superior. So what we wanna do is for each of our measures, we're gonna create two variables. One, two calculated fields, two Booleans. Measure A is greater than measure set B, measure whatever, and then the inverse, or B is greater than A. So let's, let's, oh, I should have stayed on a worksheet. Let's go back. No, oh, actually not that, sorry folks. Let's, let's go to one that we're actually building here so we have the perspective. 
So here you see one like profit ratio greater than uh, A is greater than profit ratio set B, profit ratio B greater than A, right? And we actually need each, we need it both ways and it has to do with how we assign our, um, our shapes, right? Because when the left side is superior, when A is superior and we set this to check, right? Then what's B going to be equal? It's going to be blank. Well, what about when, when if we have the same variable and B is greater, basically you're, you're kind of in a catch 22 there. You're, um, you're not able to display it. So you need two variables. If someone figures out a way to deal with one, you just let me know and, and we'll fix it. But I say you need to. So in this case, uh, we have those values, our, our conditional Boolean set up. We drag that to shape, we assign the shape. And what you can do here then, you know, like, well, you might say, oh, you know, this is superior now. Do I have to like fool around with all my sets to get it to be the opposite one being superior? No, you could just come in here and edit this and like temporarily comment this out and set this to false, right? And then you could set up the other shape at the same time without having to fool around and find data. Just a way to kind of work through this. And I believe I have that mentioned. Yes, so I did talk about this. What I did do for the one variable, let, let's check this out because this, this could happen in your case too. Like look at days to ship. This is actually the, <laughs> the opposite of the other ones. I'm getting to reload again. Days to ship, right? If you're faster, you're better. So I actually reversed the uh, logic on the um, variables for that. And it's actually looking for days to ship less, right? Days to ship less. Uh, it's up to you. You could either reverse the name of the variables or you can reverse the conditions, but just keep an eye out for that and think about um, you know, what's the best way, what's the least confusing way for your own mate maintenance, right, to set that up. So that is step five. We're getting there. So that was just setting up the variables. Now we're talking about the actual charts, one for set A and one for set B for each measure. So if we go back to an each side of benchmarker, right, there's one, two, three down this side, one, two, three down this side, right? And in those, I'm using a, a dummy column here, and it has to do with how the labels appear around the shape. So this is like a hack, but it's pretty easy to set up. All you do is double click here and enter a zero. Tableau will convert that to sum of zero. And then you get your column. You put um, your Boolean variable on shape, assign your value there. Uh, put the A value on text, right? And on the tooltip, if you want to have tooltips, that's up to you. And one of the keys here is on your label, right? On um, the left-hand side, you want to set your label to right. And then for set B, you on the right-hand side of the viz, you want to set the alignment to left. That way, the uh, checks, if we go over to public, the checks are always on the outside here, the outermost. So this is on the left, right? Left of the shape. This is on the right of the shape. Let's see how many of my points I covered here. Oh, I already talked about that. Text. And the alignment. All right, that was step six. We're done with it. Step seven, that's easy to differentiate. Um, well, it's a lot of work to make sure it's all congruent, but differentiate set A and set B colors. As I said at the beginning, for me, set A is orange everywhere. Set B is blue so that you can you know, see that easily. Oh, and this is more like setting it up. This point uh, eight on any given worksheet, you might might want to right click one or more sh uh, sets and show sets so that you can test on that sheet. Do not show filters, right? We want we want sets, not filters. And just so that I don't forget about this, 
if you want to test out how your sets are working or verify, I have a set checker here, which actually has filters and you can check the base value of the measures here, right? That, that, um, that exist and see whether this, these are actually coming out correctly. So this isn't based on sets at all here. You can come over and see how that works and, and compare. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat because I see some things here. Well, I will look at that set assignment uh, later just because I am terrible at answering questions on the fly, but I don't want to lose track of that, Matt. Um, send that to me if you don't mind over on LinkedIn. I, I'm like they said, like Sam said, I, I, I'm active on there and I, I will look into it. All right, where where was I with all this stuff? Yeah, you may wanna you may wanna look at the uh, sets and test things. So then we're really pulling it all together. Let's let's look in to how this thing is set up layout wise, right? And let's look at the layout tab. So I am a big fan of keeping this organized here, right? And renaming stuff. So if we look, like if we click here, let's just say I was on this and double click for the parent, I got the whole container, right? If you didn't see that, you can, if you have any individual worksheet, if you didn't know, you can double click to go to one parent level container right there. That is set A stats. If you don't know how to rename these, it's the last um, item on the list. So set A stats are there. I have this thing that holds the whole viz. If you start with a container that uh, covers the entire viz, then you don't end up with those um, tiled container types that spawn like rabbits for no reason. So the uh, Andy Creeble has a good uh, video about how to do that. So anyway, we have set A stats. We have the central met metric list here. I don't rename every single container. Some of these, I, I keep the defaults. And set B over there. So then just line up whatever supporting sheets you want in those. Then step 10 is setting two uh, vertical containers with show hide buttons for the set definition. So what we do here, right, is you would, you know, to get it started, just drag a floating vertical container over here, and then you're going to add your... Uh, show hide button for it and that'll set it up. And that's what I did for each of these. And then once you're in here, right, select one of your graphs, then you wanna go sets and then you just wanna go down your set order and pick them out for set A. You know, Tableau, I think that like, if someone knows the rule here, you, you tell me, um, but it seems to uh, put a set at the most forward container. I don't know if it's the actual rule, but you may have trouble finding wherever it puts it. Now, I must have selected another graph for some of these because it seems like almost all of them are listed here. But that is the way you want to do it as far as adding the sets and just drag them around into your containers, color them, format them however you want. And um, and that is pretty much it. You have an alternative here. So I'm using a very, it looks like filters, but you can see the set symbol in here. These are all set definitions. What you could do is if there's a limited number of these, or you can make a bigger screen, you can make, do this all graphically and can be more like, um, um, oh, I'm forgetting the term, uh, directed analysis. Somebody put the right term in the chat. So, you know, these are limited number of items. So you could just have bars. Like if I go back in the presentation, um, let's go back to that screenshot right here, right? So you could just have your criteria, Central East, right? You could have all those, a set of those for A, a set of those for B and set up set actions on each of those and make it a, a more graphical selection if you were so inclined. Now, I sort of set that up a little bit in, in one example here in, the, in this uh, customer segment. So I set this up with a, a menu action. And the reason I did that is these are sensitive 
to set A. So I am getting the, uh, the total orders, right, of each of these things for set A. If I didn't show that, then I'd be fine. I can just select one of these. But because I'm making the sensitive to set A, if I set a, a set action just on select here, it would filter to just consumer, and then I couldn't select anything else. So what I did here is I actually um, set it up as um, a menu item under set actions, and I can redefine it like that, right? So that's an example of doing it graphically. It's recalculating things. And if I go in here and look at this, so my customer segment, right? And this is just showing the same data. It's the same thing that I just did with the graph there. Everything adjusted. And if you want to see that dashboard actions, set a customer segment and you know, it's set, there's the driver, assigns values, adds values to set, did it on menu. I'm gonna take a quick look at the chat. Oh yeah, the graph, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is nice the graphical way. It just became a question of how much time do I want to put into this, this thing for public consumption. But uh, that's the last step there as far as actual build. So question like, can't this question comes up? And it was funny because I was talking to Eric Parker who had that comprehensive guide to sets. And he had tried to build something like this and he ran into the same problems that I was thinking would occur if you try to do this, right? So if you try to do it, you could use two independent data sources that are the same. But the problem you run into is you, you will have to fix your axes then, right? In order to have um, workable comparisons of your bars visually. And if you don't know how far your metrics may go you like you, you you won't be able to do it and the other thing is you're like doubling the amount of data you're putting you know behind the scenes uh i don't know if you could do this via union i don't see a way i think as soon as you filter you're sunk and there might be a way to do it with a cartesian product but then you're talking about a ton of data so feel free if there's another way to do it to you know put that out there for for consumption extending this uh, wait, I see a question. How can you apply the same filter across to set B as well? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so, yeah, instead of the user selecting the same filter twice. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, okay. If you wanted the same, basically the way this thing, if I understand what you're saying, and I'm not 100% sure I do, you would have to apply if you wanted that same, um, like the thing I was doing with customer segment over here, boom, boom, like uh, just consumer and corporate, you'd have to do it over here too, either through, I set up customer segment to do it here or through here. So like, there's no way in this approach to like in one fell swoop, apply the same fill, the same sets to both A and B, right? They're independent, they're acting independently of each other. Hopefully that, that answers the question. All right, good, good. And if we set them, let's just do an example here on the one in public, Let, just for another um, look at this. Let's set all, let's apply, apply, be patient. We're gonna set each side to everything and just to see how this thing at the bottom works, apply. And it converts to everything is in both, which makes sense, right? And because of the way I set up my check marks, and you can do this however you want. You might want when they're equal to show equals. I mean, whatever makes sense to you. I just have it show nothing. Um, but there you go. So that's both. We could take a look at that. I originally was not going to cover it, but let, let's take a look at this sheet real quick. Um, this, I created a separate calculated field then section. I was thinking about this. And this, this is another one of those things like how hard do I want to work on this thing? But you could do this with actual circles and do the math and make them intersect for the percentage of intersection between the sets and make it really nice. 
So if someone wants to take that as an exercise, go out there and, and do it and put it out there and, and let us see it. That would be cool. But let's look at this section uh, or, or um, calculation for Ben section. Because I find this very useful for feedback. Actually, the production dashboard does not have this thing. I just, I saw this oh, on, the idea came from the um, um, blog articles by Bethany Lyons, right? I am like a fanboy of her work out there on Tableau. And I'm and links up to that are in the dashboard or in the um, presentation. I'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, here's the calculation. And this makes sense if you think about it, right? And again, these are, since these are cousins of Booleans, we can do this, right? If A and not B, then it's in set A only. And if it's in B and not A, set B only. If it's in both A and B, well, then that's that section we saw earlier, early in the presentation where it was in both when I did the overlap, right? And otherwise in neither. Chat, oh, Paul, you're skipping ahead. You're skipping ahead. All right. Let's get to it. So anyway, that's how you set this thing up. Um, then it's just count of orders and it's a percent by a uh, quick quick table calculation, right? Percent of whole. So um, that is useful. Let's look. So uh, wait, three, right, here you go. What else can you do with this thing? Yeah, three-way comparison. Like college, like, I don't know, like I have, a, I have a daughter in college. We did this college compare a few years ago. So you can see those out there. That would be an example of, something similar, right? You can look three, four, five colleges in a row. You could, or the components, or maybe even parameterize, right? Whether you're anding or oring, or maybe have multiple parameters and you really get fancy with like, oh, you know, where the parentheses go and everything. I don't know. I mean, you could you can make it as complicated as you want. And I already mentioned this graphical selection rather than lists. Um, so, Yes, I, I went into all that. So this, these are the articles I mentioned by Bethany Lyons, uh, eight ways to bring uh, new comparisons with set actions. And this other one about set actions, definitely worth checking out. I have to look through them more myself. Uh, just there's, she's doing different uh, domains, um, sports and finance. So I'm not like super into the sports, I'm not into the sports she's showing at all. <laughs> I don't know much about finance, so I find them a little more uh, difficult to think in those terms. Like I've kind of learned the universal language of Superstore here, but um, I need to do a little more work on those. So the big thing here, some of the, the, the wrap up, we're on the last slide here, wrap up takeaways, right? Are, um, thank you, Carolyn, for those links. Uh, one, challenge your assumptions when solving problems, right? So like I showed this, I think Sam said she had never seen this before. Eric said he had never seen this before. And I think people, and I only was able to make it because I didn't know enough about sets to know that to be into the trap that you can only combine sets of the same dimension, right? So I wasn't even thinking in those terms. I was thinking, oh, I can grab this, 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 and add them together. And I just fell into it. So. Um, that's what I would leave you with. Please connect with me or follow me on LinkedIn. I, I like to talk to people. And again, I post almost every day about something in Tableau or analytics. The weekend is kind of more free reign, but um, check it out there. I'd like to hit 10,000 this year, getting close, around 9,700, I think. And one of my mottos, and I put this on every post in LinkedIn in a shorter form, if you want to learn, try to build something, or I say build to learn, three words. So that's that's the way, uh, the best way to learn Tableau or anything else in IT. Build to learn. Yep, that's it. So that is the conclusion. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, sure. Very quickly, when you said 10,000, you mean 10,000 followers on LinkedIn? Yes, sir. Wow. That is, <laughs> that's a lot. I think I have like... 3,500 and I felt really popular up until this very moment. <laughs> well, I started doing it in, in, uh, during the pandemic and it became my hobby. And I look at it as like my volunteer work. Like you look at a lot of volunteer stuff and it's always like dealing with kids or helping the elderly. And like, I don't have sure. the patience for either of those, but I do have the patience to help people with analytics and Tableau. So 
that's what I'm doing. Amazing. Well, somebody, I see a question everybody... here. How can you? Oh, okay. I, I see, that's the same question as earlier. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, one quick one, because um, I do think we have a couple of minutes. Would love to hear, you know, you kind of really showed a lot of value to sets and how, how they can be applied as someone that's kind of more interested in this. And perhaps maybe this is somewhere on your LinkedIn already. What are some ways if you may be new to sets, you may have heard of them, but probably haven't done too much with it. What are some of the best ways to kind of get acquainted with even just developing a set, let alone starting to do the cool things that you had. Right, I would start, I'd go back to this slide, these two tutorials on YouTube. So Donna Bell Santos, uh, AKA SQL Bell, awesome. Uh, she teaches Tableau, oh gosh, uh, some university in the, in the Northwest, I can't remember what it is, of the US, that, that is great. And that covers these three use cases right here. So that is your, that is a good start and this other, um, video by Eric Parker. Uh, he steps through, you know, click by click uh, some of the same, he said I could steal as much content from him as I wanted to. So uh, go ahead and check those out. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think, I think I, I agree with Autumn. I think I have had good moments with sets and I've had really terrible moments with sets, both, uh, equally emotional so uh i will definitely reach out uh, i love sql bell I, I follow her quite a bit uh, on youtube so we'll definitely look out for that video um and yeah if you don't mind ray just emailing us i know we we sent you an email to like get you set up that would be the best way to get this document up and we will share it with everyone sure sure any other Amazing. questions uh, I don't, I think we kind of covered a lot. You did a great job during the chat, uh, during your chat of kind of covering through the, through the questions that were coming through. So I think we may have covered most of it. Uh, awesome. Quickly before I sort of wrap things up, I think, uh, Sam, you said that Prasan might have, have shown up today. Yeah, hopefully he's, um, he's on. Prasan, are you there? I think he did. I think he's on. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We're about to say you. Yes. Finally, I managed to get in and uh, woke up as well. <laughs> so <laughs> you are, Exactly. It was very, very early. I think maybe 5 30 uh, your time when we first started this call. So that's yes. Uh, 5 30 a.m. So yeah, we'd like to welcome you, Prasan, as the new APAC co host for the Analytics Tug. And I know you've Thank got you. a degree, um, and maybe if you get a chance, you can talk through, um, just do a little bit of an intro, but um, really appreciate you stepping into the fold and I'm sure you'll be fantastic. And I look forward to joining the sessions as a as an attendee next time. Would you like to have um, just a couple of minutes, take a couple of minutes uh, to run through that slide or just to, just to introduce yourself to uh, the participants? Sure, sure, uh, I would love to do that. Fantastic. So, Dal, if you get a uh, chance just to bring that um, slide yep. up with Prasad. Working my way there. Lovely. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, I wouldn't like to hold off uh, the participants because they have been going all over like with so much great content for around one and a half hours. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Prasen. Uh, I just became a Tableau Social Ambassador this year, also became a Tableau Featured Author this year and have been a very active member of Tableau Speaker Bureau. I also found the Tableau Buddy program and Apart from hosting this amazing TUG that's new to me, I've been leading Tableau Buddy Talks TUG as well. So more about how I came with Tableau is like, it's been uh, somewhere around three years and I'm currently working as a product engineer with American Express within the G innovation team. And uh, it's been great learning uh, with that team. And also apart from uh, working uh, with MXGBT, uh, I love uh, building community and mentoring people. And through my program, I almost mentored over 
250 plus data professionals and you will find me all over LinkedIn. Like uh, I've seen Ray almost every day on my LinkedIn feed. Yeah, he is always there. And uh, so I tried, I, I tried posting every day, but that's really, really tough. Like how Ray does it. And so apart from LinkedIn and apart from all the nerdy things I do, you will uh, either f uh, find me trying different different types of food i love japanese i love french food and also you will find me watching anime most of the time so that's me a quick and small intro that's wonderful thank you so much prasan i just wanted to thank um sadal and annabelle and kelly and caroline for giving me the chance to um to to co-host as well it's been a, a real joy for me and um you know if, if you you know just I'm still available on LinkedIn and Twitter to chat. And obviously if anyone makes it over to TC, whenever it is next year, I hope to make it there as well. So come say hi. So I'll pass it over to Sadal to just close out for today. Yeah, um, appreciate. Thank you, uh, Preston. You know, really excited to, to get to work together um, on future APAC tugs. We'll miss you, Sam, but definitely we'll be uh, hanging out on Twitter and we'll, we'll figure out where for the next um tc will be so we can we can hang a little bit more um very quickly i think we've got a couple more minutes um on this uh if you enjoyed this obviously you know and there are other people you would love to see speak um you can use this if you are someone that would want to speak please use this qr code um you can let us know that you want to be in a future tug uh, we're always looking for new speakers and and adding them to our list um, but the next session we already have set up is next month um, on the 21st of November, uh, and that will be on the UK time. So for those of us in the US, uh, a little bit earlier in the day, also in the evening time for anyone in Europe, um, as well as those on the, the Western coast of the United States, a little bit more Um time friendly the next apac one i believe will be uh early next year but we will keep you all posted for those in the apac region um other than that i think that is it i really appreciate everyone who hung out uh, i think we started around like 105 ish and 70 of you are still here uh so really appreciate your time and we will see you all at the next event thank you so much everybody <laughs> Bye, whatever. <laughs> well,